Welcome. To, thanks, Coach. Um, welcome to 2024. Um, and welcome to the start again of our now bi-monthly uh, modern simulation forum community meetings. Um, so we're going to kick off 2024 with a look back and in a sort of a rethinking of some of the things that we have been doing over the last few years. Um, as a preface, through last summer, we actually on the next slide, through last summer and or so the, in the last year, maybe a little bit more, a lot of new data and observations were made at the forge site. This includes the stimulation of 16A, drilling of 16B, low in well flow testing, flow back, um, and, and a slew of other, other work. It also includes reinterpretation of previous tests and previous drilling exercises. And so in early October, some key members of the team between development, testing, monitoring, we, we all got together for two full days in Salt Lake City to simply review the data that had been collected and discuss interesting or key observations. The, the purpose of doing this was to essentially rethink everything that we've been doing um, and in light of all the new data and observations that we've been collecting. So, and I'd say we met for two days, but you know, there were probably months of, of work that went into going through everything, all the data that um, went to, that they that we all shared at this meeting. And our, our meeting, that was centered on not saying here's here's what is going on here is an interpretation but here are interesting observations and then we saw our goal was to see where are some of these interesting observations perhaps aligned between different teams or different data sets and use that to help inform any revelations or, or uh, renewals i'm sorry um revisions of, of our conceptual model so <clears throat> what i'm going to go through today is a very i'm sure a very poor representation of, of the other people's work that presented and discuss things at this October meeting in 2023. Um, hopefully many of those people are on, on the call right now. And so I'll go through loosely what we discussed for the sake of time, you know, we're gonna condense months worth of work into, into 15 or 20 minutes. And then at the end of this, essentially where we summarize some key observations that essentially we all could agree on, or at least say this deserves more work or more thought. We'll, we'll close with that here today. Um, so without further ado, here, so here's the agenda from the October 2023 meeting. Um, and you can see we started out, so we, we decided to go through it in a chronological order, not by either well drilling or, so we just started the older things first and moved um, to near in time. So including starting observations from 16A drilling and characterization. Then we looked at stimulation of 16A, flowback waters and geochemistry. And then we actually did some, some hydraulic testing in 16A, some slug testing, this is post-stimulation. And then we looked at 16B drilling and characterization information and 16AB um, interwell flow testing. Now I listed over here who the key presenters were, who were in charge of those parts of the meeting. Um, you'll probably recognize all the names. And as I said earlier, I hope many of these people are on the call today to answer some of your questions. So what we'll do is I'll, I just stole a few slides from each of these people and I'm going to go through this in the same order and, and, and go through two or three slides of what some of these people said. And if you have questions, um, I'm trying to present on one screen. So I won't, it'd be hard for me to monitor any questions that come in. Um, and so hopefully if, if you have a question, feel free to either raise your hand um, or I would say gently interrupt. Um, but we, we could take some questions as we go. Um, but as I said earlier, these things are meant to be high level you know, not in-depth discussions of all these topics, but basically just high level and kind of as an example of some of the things we discussed. So <clears throat> starting with um, some observations, some 16A drilling and characterization. Um, largely, you, this slide's been seen before. This is from Clay. Um, essentially, we're seeing a bulk of the rock, metamorphic and the plutonic rocks are similar. Um, we see mineral assemblages. Um, there's fairly low porosity across the board, low permeability. Um, their open fractions are not essentially in the reservoir, or essentially they're not interconnected. So we essentially had very little fluid gain or loss. And you know, important observation we made during some of this early testing is the static water level. So we actually in, um, outfitted or instrumented all of the deeper off offset wells at the forge site last summer 
to look at see if we see any pressure interference or response from we we're, we're planning to do the um, the stimulations or the flow tests in between A and B. And the the wells where we had done stimulation, so fifty eight thirty two um, sixteen A and I forget the, the last. Um, so we, we would place the uh, pressure transducers. And in doing so, we wanted to fill the wells up first so we could essentially have a, a fairly high resolution transducer. They weren't very deep in the well. And all the wells that had been previously stimulated lost fluid. So they actually would drain down to nominally 500 feet below land surface. The wells that were unstimulated, the static water levels stayed at the very top of the casing and didn't lose any water at all. Just an interesting observation, um, <clears throat> one, of, one of many. So... Another interesting observation that really came from, from 16A was halite in the veins. Now, this is just an example slide that I stole from Wood Clayton. But um, what you're seeing here in some of these things is that you can actually fill by chlorite, chlorite, smectite, hematite. Um, and some of these things actually, you could see um, interlayered illite, smectite. The takeaway here is there actually are salt. In, in some of these, in some of the, the veins or formations or cracks uh, in, the, in the reservoir. Um, Clay Jones and the geology team at University of Utah did a lot of work scrutinizing the 16A core um, and, 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 and the cutting assemblages to try to find the of this. And what drove it, I think, is it in this one here? No, it's not in this slide. I'm not going to get to it yet. But um, what, um, what are the, the last part here that I wanted to mention is um, for the 16A, is that through the, the logging here, the, the DFN team, Alita Finella at, at uh, I want to say Golder, but it's not Golder anymore, um, a new fracture set was added to our stochastic or our, or our mineral or fracture assemblages. And you can see it here, south, southwest with a vertical strike, kind of comes along the other side of the hemisphere. Um, so this new set was added as a response to, uh, or it, is part of the analysis and, and pro processing the data from the FMI logs in, in 16A. So um, I think that's the last part I would mention about the drilling. I know there's a lot more we could talk about and I'm not doing it justice. Um, I see no questions. If I do, I'm gonna keep moving along through here. So I wanna get to the very end of this um, where we pose about 15 of these key observations. And I wanna actually have a lot of time for discussion because I think that's where some real insight is gonna come. So. Now let's talk about the stimulation of um, of 16A. Sorry, I got to clear my screen. Of 16A, uh, here's just a standard block picture of some of the the stimulation equipment, pump trucks, um, uh, silencers, flowback diverters, uh, and and water outflow. But uh, lost my slide. So in 16A, there were three stimulations that were done. Once again, we've already discussed this at ad nauseum here in the past. Um, essentially with stage one in the open hole, stage two in the deepest perforated zone, and stage three in an uppermost perforated zone. And these they were done, there were some differences done between the two um, in comparison. So what you're seeing here on these plots are uh, surface pressure in red, pumping rate in blue, and essentially additive pumping rate for fluoridated additives would be also um, here in this purplish color. And I apologize for covering some of the, the scales or some of the axes, but that really wasn't what important. This is just to show general trends. And so <clears throat> what you could see here as we kept stepping up and ramping up the flow rate in the open hole section, we did earlier have some breakdown and, and some movement of these things. And as pressure got up, it fairly stabilized out pretty well once we got above about, um, say, 35 or so barrels per minute. The pressures seemed to stabilize out pretty well. Um, in, the, in the first perforated stage, we saw a pretty interesting or early, similar early time behavior. Um, um, once again, as flow rates kept going up, we would see a, a spike in pressure and a drop um, across the board as it, even at the highest rates, pressure kept dropping. And we saw a similar behavior um, in stage three, where we got to a maximum pressure at, at the top of the ramp and then pressure slowly declined even with increasing flow rates. Now, the difference between some of these, we've been talking about the first two were slick water fracks, I'm air quoting slick water. Uh, and the last actually was a high viscosity fluid with some micro profits. Now, part of our discussion here um, at our meeting went to mean what the term slick water really meant in the context of this. And and by and large, the takeaway message that, that I got from the reservoir engineering team 
was slick water um, in these things may have been too strong of a term. And I won't get into the semantics of this for, the, for our oil and gas friends that are on the call. But um, essentially, the friction reducers were mainly there at a concentration to limit um, pressure drop in the in the in the casing. And so they weren't highly. Um, I guess <clears throat> we didn't expect to see a lot of these these additives be very uh, pervasive at temperature and depth or pressure and time um, and temperature in the reservoir. So I'll leave it go at that. And if we have questions, I'll defer uh, quite a bit here. At the end of the simulation of 16A, and I'm going to talk a little bit about this now, is we did some interpretation of, of the hypercenters that we that came back from the, the seismic monitoring team. And we came up with essentially a, a DFN that was stimulated in the lower portion of the well. So here's actually open hole. The, the first perp stage is here. The second, or the second perforation is there. Um, so the first two stages essentially appear to be more of enhancing natural fractures or having a lot more variability, where the third one um, initially looked to be more of a your standard, you know, tensile failure growth, mostly upward, um, with essentially aligned properly with, with our stress orientations. Now, I don't have a slide for, for a lot of the details for the, the micro seismic analyses, but the, the key takeaway for a lot of the micro seismic for the hypocenters is that um, we talked about this before is that as time went on, our earliest tests had the poorest coverage with the um, for the micro seismic arrays for the downhole arrays had to do largely with either equipment not meeting the manufacturer specs or failures of one form or another. So just do the ingenuity of the the seismic monitoring team as each progressive stimulation happened, they were able to rejigger, fix, or somehow remove around the um, the downhole arrays to get better and better coverage. So what the key part here, and I won't get into it too much right now, but some of the, um, we have less certainty um, as as we go earlier in time. So the, the hypocenters from stage one stimulation of the open hole have the least amount of certainty or the highest amount of uncertainty. Um, the second stage had somewhat less uncertainty, but still high. And the third, I think we're the most comfortable with saying this is, is where they where they were, a lot less uh, uncertainty. Now, um, so after the simulations were completed or as it went along, flow back, the wells were shut in and flow back was done between these different stages. And so um, this, this slide here summarizes the essentially the injection and flow back between the three stages in, in 16A. Um, so here what you're seeing actually in red is the injection volume here in barrels on the left. Um, and the these blue curves is the flow back. So there's a flow injection period followed by a flow back period and, and followed by a shut in period for all three of those stages. And so what you're seeing here essentially is a good summary of injected fluid. And you'll see in blue is the flow back um, volume. These purple boxes or these cyan boxes are when samples were collected and at what percentage of the flow back. Um, and then once the a, a bridge plug was then set and essentially pressure was held constant until the wall was re-entered and, and the process repeated. So you'll see once again here, uh, for the second stage, injection, and then a flow back period, same thing for the third. And so at the bottom here, you're seeing in these yellow arrows where the bridge plugs were set, um, and then later where they were released or moved to the surface. So essentially, um, the, the part of this here is about 10,000 barrels were injected as part of this stimulation program, and, and about 60% of that was, was recovered or flowed back. Uh, the rest, you know, nearly 4,000 barrels or so were left in the reservoir. Now, in separate injector or separate tracers were injected with each of those stages. And what you're seeing here then is a, once again, barrels, but also tracer parts and parts per billion. So here's a tracer from the first stage during the flowback. It reached approximately 120 ppb and stayed there during the entire flowback. Um, part, the second stage tracer also recovered. You'll notice there, so we really only got the tracer out of stage two from the flow back here at the bottom is the concentration of the tracer from the first stage. And then essentially this very similar behavior here in, in, in stage three for the tracer return. And then once all the bridge plugs were, were removed or opened, we things got mixed up a, a bit in that well. But one of the, one of the very interesting things that happened during these flow back 
was the water chemistry changed greatly. So very drastic changes in its water chemistry over very short time scales. So the fluid that was injected was low salinity, essentially culinary or potable water. Um, and the early samples returned really didn't actually with the formation. So they're the same kind of a water chemistry that came back as what went in. But as you look at um, essentially volume of flow back here, you look at concentrations of things like chloride, like sodium, calcium, potassium, they went up dramatically to the point where you can see our, our chloride concentrations are approaching 4,500 um, ppm. I believe that's ppm. Um, or milligrams per kilogram. Okay, so um, essentially the, the, one of the thing is, is in this flow back water itself, over 5,000 kilograms of dissolved solids were mobilized. Well, actually just during stage one. So 5,000 kilograms of, of solids were removed from that well in the flow back, uh, the flow back fluid. Okay, so now the, the wells have been drilled, um, stimulated, flown back. Um, now at this time, we're, we're essentially getting prepared to do the inner well flow test and, and while 16B was being drilled. But we did some testing, just some very simple slug testing in 16A to try to estimate some of the reservoir properties from a hydrogeologic standpoint in this case. So essentially what we did here, I'll go back one, is um, for these, what we're calling, I'm, I'm loosely calling these slug tests, I'm gonna air quote it, is that simply had a water truck would pour water into the wellhead uh, of um, 16A to fill it to the top. Then we just try to measure the decline of, of the water level um, over time and use that to estimate some of the reservoir properties. Now, we did a number of these kind of tests. We originally started out trying to just do it buckets um, with, with slug tests, but um, it just took very long to try to pour water in the five gallon bucket. And, and the, the formation was taking the fluid so fast, you really couldn't even see it because of the, the way it flowed down the walls of, of, the, of the well or the casing. So that's when we brought the water truck in to try to do some more of these tests. And this is just an example uh, of what some of these test data look like. So you're just looking at an absolute pressure or pressure above a transducer or an airline, fill the well with fluid and then let it decline, repeat the test. We did a number of these tests um, repeatedly just, just, just because we, you know, to see if there's repeatability in here. Um, we'll move on. So some of the interesting behavior here, and this is essentially a Cooper Breedhoff Papadopoulos solution to some of these early time or to some of these, these test data. Um, and what you see here, what was interesting, is that early time data fit the, the, the model fully well, but in all cases, once we got you know about halfway through the time or time greater than a thousand seconds, um, we really couldn't fit with an analytical solution. Now, the reason for that, I'll, I'll get to later, at least, the, at least the, the, uh, the perceived reason for that we'll get to later. Um, but we were actually able to get some estimates for some the transmissivity and storativity um, in, in 16A. And here actually is a table that summarizes all the, the four uh, slug tests that we did. Um, test one here in red, noisy and reliable, that's the one we tried to do with buckets. The other three here were done with, with a, a water truck filling the well. Um, and I would say it, it took sometimes nearly an hour or more to fill the well because it was taking fluid um, fairly fast as we tried to fill it. So it, this isn't really a, a clean slug test per se, but um, it was the best we could do um, with the the means and the methodology and the, and the formation that we had. So, but in, in the end here, what you're seeing are transmissivities on the order of 10 to the minus five meters squared per second, storage coefficients around 10 to the minus six. Now, let's look at some observations from 16B drilling and characterization. I don't have a whole lot to say about um, this because a lot of that work is still ongoing. Um, the, the logs are still being scrutinized in great detail. Um, from the 16B, but some of the high, you know, higher level observations here. What you're seeing here is 16A on the left, 16B on the right. Um, yellow essentially are drawn to be what would be fracture zones, and you can, if you struggle your eye, turn your head sideways, you can see that there there is somewhat of an alignment between these wells to some degree um, between A and B, um, not quite one to one, but it seems like just with a minor offset of a couple hundred feet. So. And you know, for everyone's uh, memory, 16B is not only 300 feet directly above 16A in the, in the tangent section. Here's just a better example of that. Um, so here, the measured depth, you know, normally around between 8,000 and, and, and 10.5, um, you can see some pretty bright hits here on the FMI logs for areas that were essentially highly fractured between the wells. 
there's still a lot more work to be done, but it is, it is in process. But we did a whole lot of other things in, in 16B in addition to this. So um, there was good, quite a bit of coring done in 16B. And what we're showing here essentially on the bottom here is 16A. This is the open hole section, if you can see my pointer. Um, there's the first perf zone, there's the second perf zone. And these MEQs are colored by the different, by the three stimulations. So here we're looking north, here we're looking down nominally. And these areas here are where core were recovered. So we targeted areas where we had the most hypocenters um, to do coring in the well. So you can see we cored through this area here uh, pretty well. Um, same thing here, a little bit harder to do in these lower zones because they seem the, the MEQs are a lot more diffuse, uh, but we chose the best we could and had really great core recovery. Um, can't, say, can't say better things about the uh, the drilling team and, and the, the drillers uh, who actually did this work. It's the best core recovery I think I've ever seen for this kind of environment. And here's some examples of those fractures that came out in the core. So once again, from 16B, there's just some nominal depths, 98, 24, 26, uh, different kinds. So there's some mineralized fractures you can see here and some more open fractures. Now, as part of our analysis, the geology team actually would took these things and wash them out very carefully to try to see if we can recover any tracer materials that are dried into there. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. But one of the key things that was observed in the FMI logs, as well as in the in the core itself, to the degree you can, is a lot of the fractures that we saw in 16B um, through the core sections, and the, even along the tangent, were vertical. So we saw a lot less um, uh, of the other fractures. It's a lot of vertical fractures are predominantly there um, in here, which challenges some of our earlier conceptual models. Uh, here is some of the tracer recovery between the three different stages. Um, so stage three, the deepest, um, I, I did this intentionally starting at the bottom of the well where things seem to be a bit more mixed up. Um, through the stage two area, we saw a little bit of the recovery here. But in stage one, you know, see, we did see a pretty good recovery. So um, it, uh, it was pretty good as far as what we could see here in the deepest part that was cored. Um, said these things got a little bit dirtier, um, I think, as we went. But uh, interesting observations nonetheless. We did see some of this thing, especially in the deepest zones. Now let's let's transition to talk about some of the inner well flow testing. So there are essentially normally two circulation tests that were, were completed um, last July or July of 2023. Um, so on July 4th and 5th, um, um, a number of the tests came were turned off and on, but essentially one testing campaign. And this is the well configuration that, at that time. So in the bottom here is 16A. Here's our open hole toe and the two perforated zones and just some nominally interpreted fractures that would go vertically in the wells. And 16A, or B, I'm sorry, 16B was open the entire time. Uh, so that was open hole completion. Uh, we injected about 3,300 barrels with a max rate of five barrels per minute and maximum surface pressure normally 4,600 PSI. So um, in the second testing campaign happened July 18th and 19th. Um, this is after well 16B had been cased and completed. So what you'll see here is stage one, you know, 16A is the same. It hasn't changed, but 16B now has an open hole of 700 feet at the toe. And then the other two stage fracture stages were actually then behind the casing. So from stage three and stage two would have been those fracture zones. Or the thing that aligned vertically with those perforations is now behind casing at 16B. For circulation test one, you know, we had planned a fairly clean um, ramp up of pressure, ramp down, and a, and a, and a pressure hold back um, for, for 16B. Um, with, as always happens when the realities of the field testing happen, we had to be responsive. Um, but it, so we actually didn't do it exactly per plan, but we did a very successful test. So what you're seeing here essentially in blue is the pressure, the surface pressure in 16A and in orange, the surface pressure of 16B. So you can see here some of these response to changes in rates in some of these wells, but we also still see even at a constant rate drops in pressure um, in, in 16A, much like in, in, in multiple cases, much like we saw during the high rate stimulations. Um, what you'll see here, here in 16B is initially we had the well shut in, 
But once it reached a pressure of 200 PSI, we actually opened it and let it flow, maintained a 200 PSI back pressure. And after some time, we lowered it to 100 PSI back pressure to let it continue to make it flow a little faster. Um, we had some little data issues here. And then it well was shut in again. And you can see what these pressure ramps up would be um, uh, uh, overnight. And then the reinjection occurred again here. And you can see how actually how much pressure maintained in both 16A and B um, overnight. And then essentially the uh, testing resumed the next day, pumping resumed. Uh, we can see another increase of pressure here. Um, once again, keeping 200 PSI back pressure. Then we did some cycling in 16B um, and once again, shut it in over time. So the next test was a little bit, I would say simpler. So it meant to be a little bit longer, a little bit higher rate, a bit longer duration. So we did two, two more tests here, uh, July 18th and 19th. Um, so you can see once again, pressure ramps up, steps up again, and then at constant pressure, um, with open hole or with open valve, um, primarily in, in 16B, we did see a pressure decline. Um, some other steps here and shut ins. And the second day, there's some, uh, some other um, opening and closing and turning off things. But once again, pressure does seem to stabilize out at the highest rates and stay there for a good period of time. And you see a lot more work was done opening and closing 16B um, during the second test. Interestingly, so. During the second circulation test, when the st stage one and stage two are both behind casing, um, we were able to run some spinner logs in there to see what fluid or what, what zones in 16A were taking fluid. Um, and what you'll see here is that, now this is inverted here, the deepest zone here um, was taking normally 50% of the fluid at the lowest rates and down to about 45% at the highest rates. But these stage two and stage three, these were both not connected to the to, to the production well, but they still took a, quite a bit of fluid, primarily stage three, where it actually took on the order of 40% of the fluid um, into the into the reservoir out of, or out of the out of the uh, injection well. So there's still some work to be done here. Um, I, I don't have a slide for it, but we were actually we were growing fractures um, in uh, during the second stimulation test, these or the second flow test. So we were actually growing. The only place we saw fracture growth um, was in the fractures that would correspond to that planar feature from stage three. So this plot is a very similar data set um, for circulation tests uh, uh, two, day one and day two. But here we're actually showing the injection rate in red and then the production rate with the dots. Now this, this production rate is on the order of barrels per hour. So our flow rates are quite low. And the fluid coming out was was much like the flowback fluid um, when we uh, stimulated 16A, where it was a say a dark gray um, goo, kind of really thick, heavy fluid coming out of there. Um, but you can see that actually the rates were increasing with time, so we were, get, were getting better. And injectivity index was increasing as we went. Um, and in this case, essentially the only zone open was that lower the open hole section of both A and B. It was actually could be moved fluid into. Um, 16B. I won't talk about this at all. Essentially, a lot of work's been done evaluating those test data, um, and it is still ongoing. This is just a stiffness evolution where you can see essentially the stiffness was much reduced um, in the 18th and 19th tests. So such as the more we test the reservoir, the stiffer it seemed to get, um, which, and a, a whole series of different hydrogeologic analyses were also performed um, during some of those from those flow tests. I won't go into any of these at all. Um, short of saying that essentially different periods where it would fit some of the um, analytical models were used to try to analyze some of these different fall offs or ramp up uh, of these pressure signals. And I wanted to point out that we, you know, we did a lot of pretest modeling um, for those flow tests and essentially doing an, any number of poor elastic type responses either strain based or carbon cosetti type relations and different intense or different permeabilities uh, of these fracture sets. Um, if we sort of the low initial fracture, here actually it's the measured is in yellow, model is in blue. If we start with the low fracture permeability, and low is in the order of 10 to the minus 15, I believe, um, we over predicted the pressure um, with a high initial pressure permeability, 10 to the minus 15, uh, 10 to the minus 12, give or take. Um, we came pretty close in the early stages, but then um, once we get past this period, we didn't match the, 
the model and the field experiment work have the same flow rate, so we really couldn't compare. But more work is being done now um, to reevaluate all of these data sets. So I've gotten to the point, I've been talking for 30 minutes, um, a little longer than I planned, but I got to the point now where I'm going to go through these 15 key points that we pulled out, um, and hopefully we'll have another 20 minutes or so to discuss them. Um, so, and I, I, I'm going to take away, you know, I'll say where this observation came from, but I'm going to read these slides in their entirety because I think that's highly important. So from the seismic team, um, the absolute MEQ locations for stage one and two, there's still large uncertainty. And, then, and from their assessment, fitting planes may be an over-interpretation. They can't say that the MEQ data are related to natural fractions with any certainty. So key takeaway uh, for this one is that the DFN, based on plane fitting the MEQ catalog that we had used for the, the pretest modeling, has little may have very little um, validity in, 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 a, in a true absolute sense. Um, I won't say what we're going to do about that just yet. I'm just going to make these observations. I see a, a comment in the chat. I'll try to see what it is right here, um, if I can. Okay, well, Luke, we'll come back to you. I want to go through the slides first, because I'm not sure how long it's going to take. I apologize. Um, from the reservoir engineering team. So the various the effects of various stimulation fluids are likely only near 16A. So they, the viscosity being a function of temperature or time at a given temperature, their key takeaway was the far field fluid rheology is likely the same between all stimulations. Um, so you may have a lot more effect of those fluids near 16A, um, but the fact that it really isn't a true large, long reach slick water frack or high viscosity frack um, in, in, in the truest sense. Now, from the geology team, there were over eight tons of saline material removed during the flowback of 16A. Um, key takeaway here is there's likely a significant increase in porosity permeability near the 16A well bore, and the fracture filling material is likely dissolvable. So if these, uh, and that gets, you go back to a long story for the geologic model that would, that, that would account for this, um, but it has practical implications for how the reservoir is operated and developed uh, and, and further, further used. Um, number four, from the hydrogeology testing team. So a radial model was the best fit for the slug test. The volume interrogated is likely small, so the but the transmissivity near the well bore of 16A anyway is quite high, but the extent of that high perimeter, high transmissivity zone is uncertain, whether it's tens of meters, probably not more than 50. Um, the key takeaway here is that like planar fractures may be what was stimulated near the 16A well bore. So from the geology team, a large portion of the 16B fractures in the tangent section were vertical. The FMI said 80 to 90% core data. It looks that way, but we can't really be certain. Uh, the key takeaway is that we need a lot more analysis to confirm this. But if it's true, it really could help support the fact that the vertical fracturing may dominate in both the original fracture orientations and the stimulated fracture orientations. So um, a lot more work is going to that right now um, as I speak. So number six is from the reservoir engineering team. The rate of, of leak off or pressure drop after shut-in seems to be smaller after these large injections i.e. the formation builds and holds more pressure after high injection events. And the key takeaway is that larger volume injections essentially fill all of the available storage. So there is storage available in the reservoir, whether it's small natural fractures that are disconnected in the vicinity of the, of the stimulated volume. Um, but the effect of the reservoir is effectively isolated and closed because those things hold, um, it would hold thousands of PSI um, for, for weeks at a time between some of these tests. Continuing on, from number seven from our geology team, there are zones of high fracture intensity nominally aligned between A and B. Individual fractures from the most highly conductive zones in FMI seem to align vertically. So there is, you know, it's not a surprise here, but the geologic structure between 16 A and B has continuity. The exact geologic relationship still needs to be confirmed, but that's that's being worked right now with the reevaluation of the logs between both of those wells. So uh, another point from the en reservoir engineering team is that the fresh opening pressure between the open hole and perp zones um, is different. And this is likely a near wellbore tortuosity artifact. It relates, uh, relates to the wellbore pressure, is that the near wellbore pressure drop is affected controlled by more than just the number of affected perforations. Um, that becomes really important 
essentially start looking at the well hydraulics um, and essentially where those fluids are going to go. Where if you take a look from a limit entry kind of a formulation, where it may or may not be effective, at least we have large perforated zones. So there's a lot more to it than just those perforations that are kind of some of those pressure drops. Another point from the reservoir engineering team is that we seem to have separated systems from each stage. So stage one and stage two DFN may be inappropriate. Um, as the fractures were interconnected as related to point one. Um, and point one, just to refresh your memory, was that once again, the DFN that we used have, may have little very, um, validity. Point from the geology team is that we may have accounted less metamorphic rocks in 16B versus 16A. Don't know what this is going to mean yet, um, but it can have a very practical effect on mechanical rock properties. And that's part of the analysis that's going on um, between A and B and, and reevaluating all the logs right now. So we could do hopefully volumetric estimations or distributions for rock properties such as uh, Young's modulus and, and other things. So we can really help with some more mechanical um, simulations. Now from the geology team, tracer was found in the core intervals and correlated to the injection locations. We also had some cross zone flow in the formation, but not necessarily in the injection well. This may add, see, this is, a, this is a contracting point or a contrasting point. This may add some confidence to the DFN from point one as the hypocenter is used to choose those coring intervals. So we did find tracer, we saw them, whether those DF, those hypocenters relate to an active fracture or just a stress release or a fluid made it there. Obviously, fluid did make it there. So um, point 12 from the reservoir engineering team, the pressure response time between A and B decreased over the testing campaign. Our initial test took about 40 minutes to see pressure arrive. Second test was five minutes. Third test was one minute. And then the last test was, was less than a minute. So essentially, once we fill up all that available storage, the natural pressures, and the reservoir is effectively isolated and closed, um, the filling fluid available storage makes the system more responsive. Getting close here, folks. Um, point 13, uh, hydrology testing team. Um, there seem to be no changes in permeability over the 2020, July 23 testing campaign. So... The flow test in July 2023, they didn't have a permanent effect on the reservoir. And further, it seemed the permeability didn't respond in an expected poroelastic way. And I say that expected poroelastic way because we didn't see a, the, the kind of pressure or the permeability response, the large changes in pressure um, from the pure poroelastic response in, the, in those fractures. Um, so it tells me that there's something filling those fractures, perhaps, um, that could be helping control some of that permeability. Point 14 from the hydrogeology team. Um, the zonation of permeability between A and B. Um, permeability near 16A is, is significantly higher than the permeability near 16B. Um, the nature of the transition is uncertain. And lastly, from the seismic team, fracturing did occur in the July 23 flow testing, was mostly measurable in stage three. Um, the, the key takeaway, though, is the pressure drop associated with flowing well with flowing well 16B was not enough, or the well wasn't connected to the formation enough to keep the far field pressure gradient below the frac gradient. I'm gonna stop here. I did see one or two comments come in. Um, I think is, I do have a few other slides that show some pictures, but I'm gonna leave it there and open it up for any conversation. I know there's a lot of information there, uh, but I think it's important to share as much as we can as we go forward, especially those of you that are working on the reservoir or working on projects that have to do with the reservoir. Uh, Luke, if you just wanna kind of unmute and ask your question and then we can um, go from there. Sure, Rob. <laughs> Thanks for the presentation. This is no Luke at Los Alamos. Um, so I just had a, did, did you ever get a copy of the fracture interpretations from the Pivot Datathon last year? I did. I can't, okay. I don't, I, don't they, I can't recall any of the, anything in particular right now though. Okay, yeah, because we did get uh, three different geometries in addition to the one that you've been using from Alita's uh, interpretation. So just having a few more hypotheses might be helpful for you. So if, I will say right now, we're, we're testing some simpler, uh, some simpler domains or some simpler geometries. Um, well, well, so the Itasca team is doing some flow, uh, modeling the flow experiments using essentially the, the entire DFN, all the fractures that they had simulated in their, in, in, in their X-Site models but having a, a shell around 16A um, with high permeability and then having it essentially be a lot lower or more responsive 
further afield. They're doing a pretty good job matching some of those data. Um, what we've taken on here doing at the INL is um, we one, we've made a really simple um, domain. So it has three any shape cracks per se um, in there, and essentially doing some calibration of that still with either strain based or pressure based um, permeability functions and doing a really good job matching the early and late time, still working on matching some of those pressure declines um, when there's fresher growth. So, um, but I, I could look at that. Um, look, let's, we could chat about that more offline if you like. Sounds good. Um, and I do I, can I ask one more? Yeah, or... well, you, well, you got the floor, go right ahead. Okay. Uh, so have, have you had a chance to look through uh, Jack Norbeck's and Timothy Lettner's paper on their results from Blue Mountain? I have. Okay. I can't, I can't pull, I can't, it's, it's been a few months. Um, yeah, yeah. So, I, I was I was pretty pleased with it. This this report's pretty nice. Um, but you know, one key question that intrigues me about this, and maybe you have some thoughts on it, is just you know they had two cased wells just like you do at Forge, and they were seeing surprisingly good connectivity, like low fluid losses, as they were doing their circulation test. And I'm just kind of I'm curious as to if there was like some secret sauce maybe for why they were getting better production than, than we're currently seeing at Forge. There's well, something we can do different. Well, I think that's what, they, you know, so we are planning the next stimulation right now. So these tests that we just did weren't meant to really optimize. We were just meant to, to, to any flow. So I do think there's lots of things we could do with the reservoir we have right now to try to optimize or increase the, 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 the production flow rates. Um, largely, I think there's um, the, um, well, it's up for debate. I won't, I don't want to get too deep into the weeds until we do some more analysis on these, but, um, you know, there definitely is, I think, some dissolvable materials that could be filling fractures. So if, if you know, that's where some of these data are, are contradictory, but, you know, some of those lower fractures that we are in, in franchising the native or the natural fractures and dissolving and trying to mobilize these saline materials and producing tons and tons of this stuff out of the reservoir, we actually need to get a lot of that stuff out of there before we get a high permeability pathway between the two. So we can have essentially high permeability around both wells, but if we have some salt or something filling a fracture that in between, we're going to be stuck with this low permeability in between, and that's going to take time to dissolve. Now, if, if the propens in... Um, you know, so trying to support these things with pressure, you know, putting profit in, in all of these things, I think could really help do some support. So we don't have to just rely on, on, totally on pressure support to keep the pressures open, um, especially in the vicinity of the production well. So there, there's lots of things that could be done there as well. And there is a very detailed stimulation campaign coming together now. And I believe we will be perforating 16B. And I, I don't, don't take me on that uh, per se if, if the reservoir engineering team is here. But they will be doing stimulations in A, doing some more perfs and different, a whole bunch of different um, stages and clusters and, and such. And then we will be coming back through and stimulating or perforating B to intersect those where they where they come through and meet 16A. So right now, you know, the first test was to say, hey, we, we can connect the two wells. We can have some flow. We can see the pressure. That was our goal. Um, now moving forward is, is to try to get a little bit better connectivity and to get a lot more higher, or like to get, try to get better flow rates. I'm rambling. I'm rambling, uh, uh, Luke. I apologize. Uh, so I see, I'm looking through some. Is it, did I answer your questions? Yeah, um, more or less. But uh, we can talk about it more. I appreciate that you gave me a okay. chance to okay. say verbally. Well, I'm hoping that the rest of my team here can sort of answer some of these questions and help me. So I'm going to just, instead of reading people's questions, I'll just go to you. Um, if I can. So Terrence, you asked about initial reservoir pressure. Um, difficult to say. So with the wells are left to sit open um, and essentially open to the atmosphere, the deep wells that have been stimulated, the water levels drop. And the static level of the water is normally 500 feet below land surface. Um, so take that as it will. Um, we do see, you know, and that is similar to groundwater elevations and hydrostatic water levels in, in the region. So, but we do have, you know, low permeability in that lower reservoir. And as I said, we pressurize it up. It, those things do not seem to be connected. So I don't know if that answers your question, but. Um, 
There's a question here about the image logs, Greg's question um, in the core sections and the non court sections. I will have to pass off to the, the geology team on that if they're here. So if Clay, if you're on, or Alita, maybe the one of you can um, can answer, help me answer this question. I see Alita's here, I don't see Clay. I haven't seen that comparison. I know in, in, in 16A, they didn't overlap. So our core was at the, it was beyond where we had the image log. So we didn't have that. Um, I haven't seen it yet for 16B. Yeah, Robert, this is Greg. Uh, just, just a bit of background on that. A uh, number of you know experiments have been done in oil and gas fractured reservoirs, and many of them showed uh, little correlation between the seismic, the micro seismic uh, events, and where uh, fractures were actually seen in core and in image logs. So to you know really try to you know, get a understanding of what's down there, just frack or just coring the areas with micro seismic events might give you a very biased uh, set of answers. Yeah, uh, point taken. The, um, the 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 cores were were so coring this in, these things was, was very expensive. So we had to really high, highly prioritize the areas we where we collected cores. So we were trying to verify we did get some of those hypocenters may have been frack hits or real hits. So that's what prioritized where we did core to look for tracer to see if it actually did get there. And you see, we see, we see, if we could see micro profits. So um, from my geology background, I would love to have cored the entire tangent. Um, but from, from, from our budget perspective, it was never in the, in the cards. So, but your point is well taken, sir. Thank you. Um, uh, Denise, I believe if I'm pronouncing your nice name, right? I have my glasses off. Um, you're asking about production rates and injection rates. I could read you, go ahead and ask it. And then I, I have an answer for you, but you're muted, sir. You're still muted, sir. Or we don't have your audio. I'll just read your question and to save some time. So the question was, um, why are the production rates much smaller than the injection rates in the circulation test? If the reservoir is full, where is the fluid going? So good question. Um, so I did, you know, in the earliest tests, you know, we did how it took a pretty long lag for pressure to build up. Um, and so the, the, I believe there is a fairly high amount of potential storage in here. We are inflating the reservoir. We are seeing volumetric, uh, um, we're still trying to calibrate to this, but looking at the strain gauges at the surface and deep, deep strain gauges to see essentially inflation of the reservoir. So we are putting fluid into storage and we're expanding that we have. We're also growing fractures. So... During that last test, there are there there are micro seismic data that that suggests that at least for sure in the stage three or that um, the horizontal more expected fracture domain the the, the penny shaped type crack was growing essentially upward and outward during those July 18 to 19 tests. So we're we're creating reservoir volume and then and filling that volume with some of that fluid. That's the best I can explain it. Because it does hold pressure, so you know it, it does leak off very, very slowly. But it, it's those rocks are tight, very tight. So, um, 0.42 gradient. Um, Terence's question again. I think that is about right. I will, if Peng Zhu Jing is on from the reservoir engineering team, I will let him answer that question. And that essentially is your just your hydrostatic gradient. I think is what you're asking about. Um, I'm not seeing them there, but I will pass that question on. Um, Mark McClure, instead of reading your question, I'll let you ask it. Yeah, sure. And first, I'll just reiterate Greg's really excellent question. You know, it would be interesting to compare the core with the image log in 16B because um, you'd like to know if the fractures you see in the core are localized to just you got lucky and you picked the right spots to core or if actually those fractures are more ubiquitous. So that would be a really interesting comparison. It is being done. Yeah. Um, but my question is, um, you know, it's interesting that most of the core fracture is vertical. I wasn't clear exactly on, was it possible to differentiate whether or not they had been newly formed or pre-existing? For example, the presence of mineralization would indicate pre-existing or other features in the walls of the fractures. And secondly, was it possible to detect the tracer? So could you tell, you know, if you, if you core through a fracture, maybe that's just a pre-existing fracture and it never took any injection fluid versus, you know, is that a newly formed 
planar opening mode crack. Um, you know, to what degree have they been able to differentiate that so far, or do they think they'll be able to? So it, that's a very challenging proposition, as you're well aware. Um, I know the geology team have been looking at as many fractures in the core that they can, and certainly very carefully rinsing them off with water to, and try to mobilize anything that's on that surface and then doing analyses for the tracers. Now, from what, as I recall correctly, and since Clay isn't on, I'll do my best to answer this. Um, what his comment was, I believe, and, and if anybody from the, the team here, if I'm wrong, please correct me, but you know, majority of the fractures like, do appear to be vertical that we, they, they encountered in B, at least in the lower part of the tangent section. And we did see tracer on some of those. Now, how many, like what percentage? Um, and, and it seemed to me that, as I recall, that Clay did mention that a lot of those vertical fractures appeared to come, I don't want to say clusters, but you know, there were there were lots of of what appear to be newly formed, un un um, uncemented or or unaltered fracture surfaces in those domains, whether they're from the stimulation or whether they're all from uh, from from drilling or, or induced fractures, I don't know. But they all mostly all were vertical. So um, that is still a subject of a lot of, of, of analyses right now. Now, hopefully that answers your question. Um, but... Yeah, I think so. I mean, another yeah. thing that could be done is, you know, an image log was run in 16A. So um, if image logs in 16B show a bunch of really strong vertical swarms of fractures in the frac zones and they weren't in 16A, then that yeah. would certainly seem to suggest they're newly formed. And I would also note that swarms of newly forming planar fractures is what's seen ubiquitously in pour through and shale or any other oil and gas application. So it wouldn't be a surprise. It would just be, this is like everything else. Okay. That's good to know. Yeah. Um, there, there's a whole lot of things we could, could kind of leap off from there. I'll leave it go though. Um, Luke, you had another question here um, about mud bubbles. You want to you help me with that one? I'm not sure where, where you're going. Sorry, I'm eating a carrot. <laughs> a lot of noise <laughs> in the background. It's my lunchtime too. You should be sharing. <laughs> um, yeah, but this, guy's, this might be a kind of a three way question for you and Mark, but, um, you know, you know, the uh, Blue Mountain site did have a lot of propent. Your fractures so far have not had propent, right? There was some micro propent put in the stage three injection, but it, I mean, it was like yeah. 100 mesh stuff, really fine. Okay. And very low concentration, I would say, too. Yeah, so, you know, at the, at the wells at Blue Mountain, they're pretty close to true horizontal, so they're going to have some ups and downs. It's typically very difficult to cement the crown to fill in that space. So I'm I'm wondering if uh, the lack of cement in the crown of the well at Blue Mountain might be a contributing factor to how they're able to get as much production as they see. Uh, I don't know if they have logs to see if they filled that space or not. I'm guessing in your well, since they're more inclined, you'll probably have better cementing, more uniform cementing, which might make it more challenging to get a, a flow loop going. Does that make sense? It, it, I think it does. Um, I did, you know, at least from the 16A, I have, for the cement bond logs, we looked at those really, we scrutinized those very heavily in A. I haven't looked at them for 16B yet, um, but we were looking at those and trying to decide, you know, as we were doing through our perforation zone selection. So we want to make sure we, where we went, we had a good cement job. Um, so we wouldn't have a chance of losing the casing or splitting the casing. So, um, but further than that, I really don't want to comment on comparison productions because so we didn't, our goal for so far hasn't been high production rates. We were just able to show that we connected them. So um, we'll be able to talk about comparing some production rates, um, hopefully by mid-summer. So, you know, th that that next um, stimulation will happen in March, April. And then we'll be doing some more, a lot a good a flow campaign after that. So um, we'll have a lot more to talk about here, um, here really, really soon. I, I'm not trying to dodge your question. That's the best I can do for right now. I don't want to get into blind comparisons. So uh, it's all good. I'm just trying to make sure that we have uh, options on the table if we end up having circulation issues later on, because historically that's always been a challenge for EGS. Yeah, agreed. But well, cool. Would you like to ask your question? Uh, yes, I was talking while I was muted, but uh, I was just wondering, um, you know, uh, this, the 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 uh, 
we had put in a DFN uh, based on uh, some of the earlier work that was done by, by Alida and her group, and then simulated the hydraulic fracture growth. And our uh, uh, DFN that was created with the with the with these stages of fracturing basically showed vertical fractures that were relatively planar with some branching, uh, which looked you know very different than 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 the picture that you showed. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm just wondering if the circulation tests might be might indicate that that is uh, sort of leaning more in that direction. That might be a more preferred geometry than than this more complex one. What, what are your thoughts on that? Well, the simple answer is we'll never know. Um, that's the beauty and, and curse of fractured rock hydrology, right? Yeah. Um, to some degree. Now, um, follow on testing, we will have a better, I think we'll have a lot better micro seismic coverage. Um, going forward, because we've worked through a lot of the issues with those instruments, be it temperature relations or temperature restrictions, and and how we do it. So, um, so we may or we may see some additional response in some of those other zones. Um, but you know, with those early zones, the, the seismic team were very adamant that don't overinterpret those results. So that's what prompted our, our team. We're actually looking through this in a whole bunch of different ways right now. Um, I still stand by some of those. You know, I I, I think it's within the realm of possible. Um, but, uh, there's definitely could be a lot more to the story or perhaps a lot less, you know what I mean? If, if I'm saying that the right way. So, um, yeah, but, you know, I, I didn't mention, cool. I'll be in, I'll be at UT in March. Maybe we could get set up a time to visit for an hour or two to go through some of this stuff. I'll, I'll yeah, I think that would be very beneficial because I mean, you're, you're right. We'll, we'll never know the details, um, and, and the, ex and the exact geometry of these, uh, fracture networks, but, I think it's an important question to try to address with the data that we have uh, eventually to be able to say whether, you know, the natural fractures are playing a dominant role and 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 really, you know, completely changing the geometry of the fractures or, or are the fractures, the hydraulic fractures really playing the dominant role and the natural fractures are making the difference, but the, essentially having branches and, and, uh, small uh, changes to the to the to the dominant nature of the of the hydraulic fractures, which is a vertical planar uh, with some branching, uh, but not extensive, you know, uh, branching. And I think it, and that'll be site dependent. But I think in this site, it uh, at least from the limited data we have, it seems like um, these fractures would be vertical and um, primarily vertical with some branching associated with, with which would provide the additional storage and also some additional pathways for the fluid to go through. Um, yeah. Th that's where some of my angst comes in, McCool, is that, you know, for the kind of volume we're putting in the storage, just having mm -hmm. three normally horizontal or vertical pressures, there's not enough volume there to, to store all that fluid, right? So we have to be franchising a good bit of some of those natural pressures, mm -hmm. whether they're dead end or not, to, to take to store all that fluid. We'll really get some answers to this, I think, once we get some longer term tests where we look at the thermal response, because that's going to really help us tease out some things that have to do with um, uh, effective surface area available for heat transfer. So mm -hmm. I think we'll get a lot more from there because that's very stark contrast in how we do that. Yeah, so, no, I think we'll learn a lot more from the tracer tests also as, as we do those tracer tests and the circulation. And so, agreed. so that's, it's still an open question, but I think I think it's, a, it's an important question to be able to address. Agreed. Agreed, sir. Thank you for your comments. Yeah. And I'll reach out to you via email about the dates I'll be in, in, in Austin. That's That'll safe. be great. That'll be great. Love to see you. Thank you, sir. Um, Sheeman, G, do you uh, want to ask her? Sure. Um, I have two questions. One is on seismology and the other on hydrogeology. So the first one on seismology is uh, uh, what does the post-stimulation seismicity look like? Um, because they are having some speculations about how shut-in and flowback operations um, could impact impact uh, seismicity, so fracturing, and particularly some larger ones has observed after shut-in. So I'm just curious about the seismicity data. And then the second one is about um, the test, hydrological test, where um, have you considered uh, pumping test between the two boreholes. Um, I know you did tracer and whatever. It seems like a pumping test would be a good way to see the connectivity and more, um, yeah, it's more uh, active way to see connectivity between the two boreholes. So to your first point, 
is these stimulations done to date were fairly what I think well, by most standards would, would be considered to be low volume or small. Um, so between the shut-ins and so we didn't see, and if, if any of my seismic team is on here that wants to correct me, um, you know, we didn't see very high, high magnitude um, uh, seismic events. And between things during shut-in or flowback and long-term, um, we really didn't have a whole lot of, uh, of, of seismic activity between. So the site is very, very quiet by and large. When it's, when it's not being disturbed actively, I guess I should say. Um, there's a whole lot of literature on that. I actually could push you to the, uh, uh, the Forge website. And I, if, if you want deeper details on that, I'll connect you with the uh, uh, with the seismic team. Now, regards to your, your hydro, the slug testing. So the slug tests were essentially not even part of our testing campaign. It's that a number of us were sitting on site, wiring up data loggers and preparing for some of the the drilling while while 16B was being drilled, doing things to get ready for the flow tests, which we did a lot of, of flow tests already. And so there's four tests that were done. Um, so the, those slug tests, they are I would I would agree with you, they're inconclusive. They they were quick and dirty, um, but they were better than the data we had otherwise. So, but I do agree with you. It's wanting to do a lot of series of detailed um, tests in these wells, and that's something that is a non-trivial exercise and something that that we try to negotiate to get into our budget and our time is to be able to go through and do detailed testing on each stimulation zone so we can test them independently. That hasn't happened to date and I'm not sure if it will be able to happen due to limitations on the availability of packers that will survive at these temperatures and, and other things. So we will be doing a lot more flow or, or I, I would say inner well testing or pressure interference testing and flow testing over the coming months. Um, and those will get more and more, they'll get longer for sure, which will help. And then um, hold with hopefully a little bit more granularity and a lot better monitoring as we go. So, um, but thank you for your comment. And um, if you thank have any you. suggestions on ways to do it, let me know and shoot me an email. And I'm happy to try to incorporate them into some of the testing plans. Thank so, you. Um, Jeffrey Bailey, question. Oh, I actually, I confused. so go ahead, go ahead and ask your question. Yes, yeah, so I joined late, but I was wondering whether um, microseismic data was collected during the circulation tests and has it been analyzed? So we didn't have it at all the downhole, the detailed downhole multi-level arrays in place, but we did have all of our fiber. Um, we have a number of wells with DAS, DAS fiber, and we also have a number of our own observation or our, our own um, seismic stations for long-term observation. So Yes, it was data were collected during the flow tests. And the primary, the primary response was we did see what was, was interpreted to be fresher growth from the planar feature highest in the well of 16A. So that well did grow. It, 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 um, apparently, a lot of the, the hits, the hypocenters, were around the periphery and the vertical and somewhat horizontal parts of, of, um, of that third stimulation zone or that more of the, the more vertical fracture that I showed early on. Mm -hmm. um, in the initial injection, the um, that open hole section at the, the toe uh, did actually have some fracture propagation down. I was wondering, maybe you could have lost some fluid down there. Well, you asked, I said, Gwen, I didn't catch that question. Well, thank you. We... I'm not sure I understand that question. Um, well, we were talking about where fluid could have been lost to, and there may have been some downward propagation or, or flow at the from the open hole section at the toe. Uh, the initial injection in that zone did have some downward growth. The other zones were mostly upward, but the, that initial section did have some downward growth, I believe. It it did, with the caveat that the seismic team said, don't trust those hypocenters. So, um... Yes, so we, we, th there's and, and so that open hole section is is not only 200 feet long too. So um, you know, yeah. we, we, and we don't have we weren't able to get a tool an FMI log through that entire section. So we were a little bit blind with what's in the toe. To be honest with you, we 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 did log some some fractures there, and um, it was far as we could go into it. But there's we're blind for three quarters of that as far as at least pre-testing characterization. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you. you.
Greg, I see you typed a comment or a question, and you have lots of comments about it. So why do you want to share that with us, please? Yeah, sure, Robert. Um, yeah, just an observation. Uh, looking at those cores that you showed, they mm -hmm. look exactly like some of the cores Conical Phillips acquired in the Eagle Fur, some of the uh, cores from the HFTS projects in the Permian. So, I mean, really interesting results that you're in a very, very different environment, different rock types, but you're seeing, you know, very, very similar geometries, particularly that closely spaced sets of uh, planar fractures. Um, that, that was one thing that really surprised us back in 2014 when we acquired the core in, in the Eagle for, you know, just pervasively fractured rock, thousands of planar fractures created by hydraulic fracturing. So really interesting and, and excited to see where that goes. Same here. Uh, and, and, you know, that that's, that's one of the things, too, it's going to challenge, I think, some of our conceptual models, which is why we did this whole exercise, is take a step back, see what we have, and rethink things of how we're approaching this. So I think a lot of those things here, I appreciate all the discussions today. I saw that Jeff and Luke kind of responded to your question there, your comment. Um, so we'll, uh, I don't need to call on those, but um, I'm really happy with um, what we're learning to date, and I'm really looking forward to the future stimulations that a number of you on this call actually had a hand in designing um, and uh, we'll, we'll go from there. We still, I still have another 10 minutes or so, 15 minutes available. Any other further questions or comments, floor is open. Hi Rob, this is Sharzad from University of Utah. I was wondering why do you case part of the wellbore, the production wellbore? Would it fail if you don't case it? So, um, I'm sorry, I skipped over your question. I just noticed that. So I didn't, I didn't no. omit you intentionally. I want to, let me apologize before I say that. No worries. So, the, the, so there's a couple of things that, that come into play is essentially controlling the reservoir to the degree we can. And, and the, some of the dynamics of an open well in a fractured rock environment. So, and also the fact that we need to go in and out and do a whole lot of intervention with tools in these wells. So the decision was made early on that we're going to case these wells and do a, a plug and perf type completion on them. So we can one go in and out with, with without having to worry about um, whole, the whole stability of the natural rock and have to worry as much as with, with some essentially what we call thief zones. So in, in, in a lot of production systems, the, uh, some of those, the production well may be fully open and just any fresh that can produce fluid will. But this is essentially for control and for, for monitoring um, and for accessibility of the reservoir is why we did that. Mm -hmm. And you left part of it open, part of it case to see which one would be benefit, right? The production benefit from which, which configuration? To some degree, yes. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, now, when we get the final production mode, we may have to, those open hole toes, they they may have to be sealed off. I don't know. I mean, there's a whole lot of things that are going to go into this, and there's years worth of research ahead of us. So mm -hmm. um, I, I, mean, I don't want to shake the crystal ball or the, you know, the magic eight ball too hard and try to understand what we're going to do. But um, 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 there's a lot more to go here. And, you know, there are there has been discussion of additional production wells or additional long offset wells at the site. So if those mm -hmm. things come to pass, um, then we'll have a lot more. We get presently, potentially think about different completion methodologies then too. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, so, Luke, I see your question about you know future stimulation. So we have one planned right now. I believe it will be for, and don't quote me on this. I think eight total stages, and within each stage, some may have multiple clusters. I don't. I don't want to get into the details. I have a. I have a conceptual figure of it here. I'm not going to share it with you in like detail, but essentially there's your open hole as you get to it. There's what some of the plans are. And I think you're going to take up about maybe 500 meters, 1,500 feet of the well. So there's, or a little less, maybe 1,000 feet to 1,500 feet of the well um, near the bottom. So we'll still have a lot more uh, real estate in 16A to stimulate later. Any other questions or comments? This is a great discussion today. I really appreciate it. Thanks everyone for joining today. 
Oh, Rob, sorry. Again, Sharzad, I was wondering if Luke will share those other geometries that he was talking about through you or with everyone. I don't know how. Um, shoot me an email. I know I, I have those data. And oh, okay. I, and I can either connect you with Luke directly, which I probably do, and I'll let him do the discussion of most some of that is his. Sure. Thank you so much. My pleasure. This is great. Today. I really appreciate it. So we'll meet again in March. I don't have the topic laid out yet. There's, there's going to be a lot of stuff that's going to happen between now and then as far as matching those flow tests and stimulation modeling for the next round of stimulation. So depending on where we fall in there, that'll, that'll guide the topic for our March meeting. So thanks again, everyone. I really appreciate it.